My name is Ben Sensabel. I'm the founder and CEO of CO2 Bamboo. As you can see here, we are into housing, which is prefabricated. So let's start with the problem. Uh, we, as a company, all are motivated to have a number of impacts. Specifically, we are looking to address the Latin American housing deficit, which is huge, roughly 40 million homes uh, lacking. And this is a very important issue because in the past, the sources of funding were national governments, NGOs, and international institutions. So there was always a gap between the need and available funds. So that figure wasn't very helpful. What's happening now is the world of microfinance uh, is discovering the world of BOP housing. So the gap between need of housing and available funding has narrowed considerably. So the market is about 40 million and the need is about 40 million. The second issue is natural disasters. We live in, uh, in Hurricane Alley. And uh, if you look at uh, the map here, you can see that uh, we, we have a pattern. We have a pattern of hurricanes, of flooding, and more recently, earthquakes. The third issue is climate change. In Nicaragua alone, we lose 70,000 acres every year to deforestation. And this is a big deal because Nicaragua holds the second largest forest uh, in the region outside of uh, after Brazil. And finally, we hope to have an impact on unemployment. And while unemployment is high, generally speaking, in the region, in the areas where we work, uh, which is in the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua, unemployment is as high as 85%. So you can imagine that the impact we can have by putting $1 in the community or creating one job is, uh, is extremely high. Well, let's start with visuals, uh, because when we say bamboo houses, people immediately default to something they might think about a, 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 a cabana on the beach. This is not what we're talking about. We are talking about uh, robust 40-year houses, which happen to be made, as this picture shows, within structure, which is all bamboo. And I'll uh, show you, if you want to come afterwards to, the, to uh, the tables, I'll show you specifically the materials. But all of these houses, and you see a family of houses. They can be on the ground. They can be on pillars. This is 34 meters or 340 feet. Uh, this is 420 square feet. Uh, some uh, are on very high pillars and so on. There's a range. Uh, but the fundamental uh, design uh, elements uh, are common to all. And this allows us to address a number of markets, which I'm going to talk about now. Uh, but let me first give you the, uh, let me spend two minutes on this, because there's a lot of information, I, and I hope this single chart can give you a good feel for who we are. So the technology, first of all, is bamboo. There's world-class bamboo in Nicaragua, which is opened and flattened into something that becomes usable like a, uh, a flat uh, piece of timber. And that allows us to do all sorts of things. Uh, that is a technology that has existed uh, for many years in countries like Colombia and Ecuador where they have the same kind of bamboo. It's new in Nicaragua only because there hasn't been anyone to step up and develop that industry. Talking about the teams, um, conceptually, I run the business uh, with uh, Julio Rizzo, who is here as our technical director, and uh, Dr. Ferre, who is in the back, our, our director of government relations. And we think of the business as uh, three activities, essentially. The first one is manufacturing. We manufacture prefabricated housing panels. And then we run it uh, along lines of programs, country programs or regional programs. So right now, for example, we have a large contract in the place called Rosita, which is in the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua. And uh, we, have, we started one team, two teams. We're now up to six teams of assemblers. And these are the people who receive the prefabricated panels. And they go in the field and they assemble the houses. You see a third picture because we have our first, I'm very proud to say, our first Haiti team, where we, um, uh, we went to Haiti and we assembled a team to start being able to assemble teams, uh, to assemble uh, prefabricated shelters and houses in Haiti. So that's the teams. Talking about the facilities, if any of you have a chance to come and visit us, um, we built a very impressive bamboo uh, factory. And it's, a, it's in bamboo for bamboo. And what's critical about this is that it is helping shift perception of what bamboo is about. Uh, there is not a long history of use of bamboo in Nicaragua, unlike places like Ecuador and Colombia. And so having a very large structure enables us to talk to beneficiaries and say, if we can build something this big, we can certainly build your 18-meter or 34-meter house. We also have a new facility um, in uh, Haiti, which is going to be the warehouse. 
just a quick flash, um, we have one factory. One of the reasons we are raising capital is we need a second factory. And we need a second factory for strategic reasons. We, uh, we do not want to be vulnerable to one area where there can be anything from political uh, disturbance to bad weather. So uh, there is a lot of bamboo in Nicaragua in two regions the autonomous region of the north and of the south, and we need to build a second factory uh, in an area where there's plenty of bamboo, but there's also a port of access, and there is a road which allows us to drive into Costa Rica, which is a market I'll talk about in a second. The brand, hopefully by now you've understood, it's about prefabricated uh, houses, but we're also being recognized for the impact we have on the environment. In order for us to be able to harvest bamboo, we had to start doing plantations development. We therefore go to the government and say, look, we're planting 10 times more than we are harvesting. They give us the right to harvest. And that's a good thing from an ecological point of view, but it's also a smart thing from a business point of view because I intend for this business to grow where four or five years from now, we won't be able to harvest in the forest. We will need to have plantations. And some of that amount of money goes into developing that supply chain. I think I'd stop here and, and keep going to the next one. All right, so our operations, uh, represented here horizontally, is really a vertical operation. Everything from, sorry for the video, I'm dancing a little bit here, um, starting from reforestation and plantations development, which we do, and we have planted already 60,000 plants, again, in the spirit of having enough material for five years from now. Then we harvest uh, in the field, and we have field processes. These, we are gradually turning over to indigenous populations in communities who sell us this bamboo, and we are increasing the value added in the communities. Industrial processes where we shape the bamboo the way we want it. Then we prepare kits, prefabricated kits. Think IKEA. It comes in a box. It's a little bit bigger. It's a big box, but it comes in a box. And we assemble, therefore, in the field um, the, the houses that we receive. We can ship them five minutes from the factory, as is the case for our current program, or we can put it in a container that goes to Haiti. Um, let me focus on the growth strategy because uh, while we have a common technology, uh, there are very different markets that we're going after, and they're all very synergistic. The first one is to do Nicaraguan BOP housing. This is what we do today. So we have a successful program. We have a happy customer. And now we're bringing in municipalities throughout the whole coast, from the north to the south, who are visiting the factory. And inevitably, they come back and say, we have a big housing deficit. We have a lot of bamboo. We have high unemployment. Why don't you do this in our area? So we will continue. This is our core business. We will continue to pursue and win these programs. The second track is slightly different, even though uh, the, the technology is the same. It's, Jap it's uh, schools. And the reason it's different, because the customer is different, but it also has a higher gross margin. Too much time to go into this. If you'd like to offline, I can discuss. But we can, with the same kind of structure, have a higher gross margin for schools. Uh, and, and there is very much a need for schools in Nicaragua, specifically in the rural context, uh, where the current solutions are not appropriate. Too heavy, too difficult logistically to, logistically to, uh, to go after. We have the first uh, potential customer that we've been talking to, namely the Japanese embassy, which has nine schools exactly where our factory is located. So this is a, a no-brainer for us. I believe we're going to win this program, and when we have it uh, constructed, we, it will open up the floodgates uh, for us to go after the Ministry of Education, uh, which has many, many schools that need to be addressed. Track three has to do with microfinance. I mentioned before the world of microfinance is discovering the world of BOP housing. Um, we are starting here in Haiti. Um, the short version is there's a lot of need in Haiti, but there's a particular segment, which is the professional class, the so-called forgotten middle. People who are small business owners, uh, head of police, the mayor, uh, the doctor, and so on, they're not going to live in the 10,000 camp, uh, house camps that the big NGOs are organizing, and their homes have been destroyed, like many people in Haiti. So there's a whole market segment, uh, which, uh, is, which is for us to sell these with microfinance. We have a strategic relationship already established with Sorge Sol, which is a leading microfinance institution in Haiti. Um, and we just this week shipped our first full container. So I'm very hopeful that about two months from now, we'll be starting to build our first uh, homes under microfinance in Haiti. 
there is a very large runway on this. There is a whole world of opportunities for now we're going to focus ourselves on Haiti. Once we've demonstrated that we can do microfinance based housing, we'll see what other countries we go after. Um, there is a permanent shelter market, which is um, really based on connecting with leading NGOs. We have a good starting relationship with Habitat for Humanity and CHF. In both cases, we hope to be doing NGO branded shelters and then they will respond to crises with their bamboo shelter uh, produced by CO2 bamboo. There's a very intriguing market, which is something which is uh, stretching the uh, social impact logic. Uh, everything here is very much about social impact. But we have to be mindful that we need to be profitable for ourselves and for our investors. And some of these activities are never going to generate a margin that's higher than 18%. So how do we get to a higher margin by addressing a higher gross margin market, which is the market for retiring U.S. baby boomers? There are roughly 10,000 Americans retiring every day and will do so for the next 20 years. Many of those are looking to Central American for a low cost of living, and we're seeing a big surge in demand. And we are, right now, I'm happy to say, in an extremely strong position with the world leader in high-end bamboo houses called Bamboo Technologies. They have identified Central America as a key market for them. They need to build a factory. We've stepped up. We've invited them here. They have told us they want to do a joint venture with us. We need to come up with the capital to build that, the factory for this. Uh, they have a 20-year technical asset which they are making available to us to address the Central American market. And of course, there are other Latin American markets. This comes way down the line when we've solidified position in Nicaragua, when we've developed our relationship uh, with bamboo technologies. This is to give you a little bit of visibility where we're going next. Competitor position very quickly. On the shelter side, this is easy. It's NGOs. They have their own off-the-shelf solutions. And our strategy is to make an alliance with leading NGOs and to have NGO-branded uh, bamboo shelters. Uh, I have high confidence we will get there. On the low-income housing, the competitor is brick and mortar, concrete blocks or timber houses. This is a head-on competition. We are not uh, joining forces with them. We need to build up uh, our position, as, and we have every reason to believe that this is attractive to a portion of the BOP housing market. Schools, uh, it's the same thing. We're competing with concrete block, and we believe we have a 30% or so uh, cost advantage over traditional manufacturers. So we're in a good position to win part of that market. And then finally, the high-end homes, um, well, the, we cannot uh, uh, develop organically that capability. We are teaming up with Bamboo Technologies, and this will give us just that layer of additional margin that will make us attractive as an investment target. Talking of which. So this is representing where I believe we're going. You can see the four colors which correspond to shelters, social housing, schools, and retirees. And I've put here the gross margin of these activities. We're not going to go past 18% gross margin, more or less, for bottom of, the house, uh, bottom of the pyramid housing or shelters. We are going to go to over 30% for schools and over 35%. This is a very conservative uh, figure for the high-end market. So where are we? From a revenue point of view, we are on track to do a million dollars in 2011. I believe we're going to grow to 3.5, 5.8, and 7.5 million. A lot of what we've been doing this year is to set the stage for 2012 and 13 growth. Um, it, it all looks favorable. We've identified a number of key programs which we believe we have a high probability of winning. So at this point, I'm sitting in a position where I'm not sweating 2012 because already in July uh, 2011, I'm seeing that the, we know exactly what we're going after. We might not win all of the programs, but there's enough of a pipeline that I have high confidence we'll get there. So our challenge is to grow the revenue line, but also to grow the gross margin by having a product mix. One more. Use of funds real quick. We need working capital to capture some customer contracts. This is critical for us. In order to sign the contracts, we need to demonstrate the ability to buy material and pay labor until the first invoiceable events. We need to build up our raw material. Uh, this is a critical issue for us. We are, uh, it, we are standing outside of very interesting contracts by just not having enough built-up material. It's a three-month process, more or less, to get bamboo to a point where it's 
cured, dried, and available for sale. And so we, our ability to reach high level, high level of revenue is paced by our ability to have inventory. Number three, we need to expand Nicaraguan uh, operations. And uh, this is the factory that I mentioned. And I'm running out of time. Exit, exit strategy, 30 seconds. We believe that there is an exit strategy with, for example, Bamboo Technologies as a leader um, in the field. We believe there are many larger companies. I've put Hemco, a mining company. It could be Cimex, a cement company. There are large companies that like the green footprint. There are institutional investors who seem to be interested in our story. And of course, there is always the possibility of leveraged buyout. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Jim Villanueva from the Elios Foundation. Um, I had two, two questions. Uh, one is, what type of investment are you seeking? I have a general idea of the amount, but how do you see that being structured? And then, uh, how is your business model evolving? It looks now like you're doing complete vertical integration, but uh, are there certain aspects of the value chain where you want to migrate your focus to? Amen, brother. Can you go back to that? Uh um, let me answer, first of all, what we're looking for. In the 650 to 1 million, I'm looking for a combination of debt and equity. Um, we've, we've had for two and a half years now some uh, debt that has accumulated. A lot of it is going to convert to equity when we have a, uh, a transaction. Uh, but, but I'm very conscious of the fact that I don't want to be too debt heavy. Uh, so I'm hoping for a mix. And, they, and when you look at our spend, there are some things that lend itself to equity and some things that lend itself to debt. So that's the short answer. With regard to the supply chain right here, this is critical. Hard to communicate all this in 10 minutes. Um, I believe we've done what we needed to do to demonstrate the concept, which is work with the communities, work with the cooperatives, work with the small farmers to be able to harvest and do small plantations development. I want to get out of this business. Our business is to design, manufacture, and assemble homes and shelters and schools and so on. There is one particular partner that is emerging as a strong cont contender in, uh, called SNV, which is a uh, Dutch uh, NGO that has extensive experience developing value chains. They've done that with coffee and with milk uh, and one more, almonds. I've talked to them for the last year, and initially it was yawn, bamboo, there is no market until I pointed out it's a $20 billion industry. And that's without counting houses, et cetera, et cetera. They've come around, um, and now they, I think, are passionate about the idea of developing a bamboo value chain. Um, and basically, we'll educate them, because they don't know a whole lot about bamboo today. They know plenty about how to develop a value chain. Um, and I look for them to develop that capability so that eventually, instead of managing all this, uh, we will generate and say, next month we, buy, we want to buy 1,000 ba uh, bamboo poles of X dimensions, and they will organize the network and do it for us. That's the natural evolution. Now, will it be SNV? You know, that depends on their funding capability and whatnot. Today, as I said here, I would say there's an 80% chance that it will be SNV. One, one quick follow-up. So on the convertible debt that's coming yep. due, is it automatic conversion or uh, no, they, well, it's uh, their option? Well, we can talk after us to, to, to one of the investors. Uh, Agora is one of them. I have a couple of angels who basic, basically have said when we have a transaction, we'll switch over. There is one um, or earlier uh, investor, which is Argidius, uh, which has provided the bulk of our financing, which is $300,000 over the last year and a half. And they are on the fence. They are saying we, we're not against the concept of converting, we just have to see when and at what rate and when it makes sense. So that'll be something we'll negotiate. So it may or may not be a use of That proceeds. one may or not uh, convert, or it may be a partial. It may be they want to convert 150000 and they want us to repay 150000 Hi, uh, Richard Ambrose with uh, Pomona Impact. I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about the unit economics and, and cost of production relative to other uh, low-impact housing companies. Uh, and really, companies that are supplying the same market in Nicaragua and Haiti, um, and just hearing a bit more on how you measure up against that. Okay, so let, let's just separate first and, and focus on BOP housing, because there are many moving parts. So let's just do the core, BOP housing. The traditional uh, competitors are the concrete block folks and the timber house manufacturers. Um, the, I'd say from an economic point of view, we are cheaper, not by a whole lot, and we need to make, be very careful to not keep reinforcing this notion that bamboo is 50% cheaper. It's not. But we have, we have the ability to be, if it's a hardcore uh, price competition, we can be more competitive and still be profitable. 
The issue comes more to where is this house going to be? So you're going to do a house in Managua where there's a cement factory down the street versus our bamboo, which is a truckload away, which is $1,000 for the shipment, we're less competitive. Conversely, if you are in the Atlantic community of Ran and Ras, where you have a boatload of housing uh, requirements, we are much more competitive because bamboo is there and our factory is there, not by chance. We built our factory there to be close to there to minimize the cost of, um, of logistics. Conversely, the concrete folks don't have factories in Ran. So the cost of a traditional house in these areas is higher by a significant amount from ours. And the timber issue has to do with timber availability. We are seeing, um, we are seeing an, an incredible inflation in the price of timber uh, in the areas where we are, um, but, but I think it's more uh, reflective of the reality of the timber industry worldwide. Every projection that I see about plywood and timber and so on shows that it's just going to go up, 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 up. Of course, because there's more demand from China, from India, and so on than there is um, uh, material available. Did that answer the question? We can talk more offline, if you will. They, they, Haiti has another set of dynamics, but very interesting. And Mark Jacobson, Pomona Impact. Uh, I just have a question. You mentioned Nicaragua is very undeveloped in this industry, bamboo. Could you give us an example of, a, of another country, either Central American, if there's, there's one there, but if none there in Latin America, that really does have a developed I'll, I'll bamboo? And that could give us also, like, what percent of the of the market or maybe almost a little history of how they've developed and, and, and gotten that percent. So we and can kind do of Do all see. that in 30 seconds. Right. Yes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can answer everything, but uh, I think there are two cases in Latin America that are very important for us. One is Ecuador. The other one is Colombia. Why are they pertinent? Because they have the very same guadua bamboo that we have. So it's not thinking what are they doing in China, which is a totally different world, different bamboo. Same material. What happened? In Ecuador, they focused on bottom of the pyramid. So, for example, there's an organization called Hogar de Cristo, which I've visited and have become friends, and part of what they've done is what we've absorbed for our capability. They do um, 50 houses per day. But they do houses that, are worth, uh, that have a price of about $1,200 and a lifespan of about three years. So that's where that industry is going. Of course, there are people on the fringes who do high-end houses, but it's basically about bottom of the pyramid in Ecuador, and they employ hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, plus more for the value chain, for the supply chain. Take Colombia, completely different story, same bamboo. They decided to focus on the high-end. Julio Rizzo, who is here, has gone there for training with the best bamboo builders in the world, and they focus on bridges and cathedrals and narco trafficker homes that are worth $500,000. I mean, that is the market, and there's a big market for that. Um, so it's interesting how they've taken the different bamboo. It's hard to uh, connect the dots and say, what, what does it have to do with us? I think the takeaway is that if you have, if you're lucky enough to have a geographic profile which gives you bamboo, then there's plenty of demand. You can decide whether you want to be bottom pyramid, disaster, high-end, narco-trafficker, high-end. You can decide where you want to play. Uh, but there is certainly zero doubt that bamboo is a high-quality building product, which is sustainable. Hi, Susan from IDB. It's not clear to me exactly to what extent your strategy is a mix of individual housing units versus community developments. But in, in both cases, I'm just wondering to what extent you have to touch on or deal with titling, property titling issues, or access to basic services? That's one question. And then the second one would be about your experience with the microfinance industry in Nicaragua specifically, to what extent they have housing microfinance products and how you're levering the, leveraging those for your customers. I'll get rid of the second question first. I have zero experience with the microfinance industry in Nicaragua because there's been so much bad press about microfinance in Nicaragua and the no payment, da, da, da. I just didn't want to soil and, and get any kind of that brand associated with us until I understand better the world of microfinance. We're going to do Haiti microfinance, and then maybe we'll sort of come back into Nicaragua. About the titling, uh, if you can see the chart about the, uh, where the revenue is, until now, right here, we focused almost exclusively on programs programs at the municipality level, programs funded by the uh, World Bank, that sort of thing. Uh, it is definitely 
a very interesting and intriguing option for us to develop a retail business here. We every week get questions from people who want a $25,000 house or $30,000 house. And there's enough of a flow of these that I'm coming around, thanks to input from an investor who visited us last week, that it really would be a smart strategy for us to have a piece of our business be independent of programs. Because programs go like this. There's a bit of a feast and famine problem. And so if we develop 20% of our business, which is retail, and there's constantly some money com coming in through retails, I think it would be smart to do that. Frankly, we haven't addressed it. We've just responded opportunist opportunistically, and we've built individual homes. Short version, we have nothing to do with titles. The people come to us with their land. Once we know that it's their land, they have to come with the titles. We don't want to get enmeshed in that. Great. Uh, any last questions or comments before we close this up? OK. Last one. I'm just curious. In Ecuador, you said that the houses had a lifespan of three years, whereas yours have a lifespan of 40. What's the difference? The difference is that they have made a very conscious decision because Hogar de Cristo has a very specific mission, which is get people out of plastic tents, but get them out to work in the, to live in the real rest of the world, the rest of the municipalities. So they do not cure their bamboo which is a conscious decision. We, on the other hand, believe that it's complete a fallacy to think that people are going to go into these homes and are going to vacate after three years. So what you see in, the, in Ecuador is they have to rebuild the same house over and over again. We spend a fair amount of money for immunization or curing, and that is what gives us longevity. And the housing cost, how much for your our, our current houses are below $5,000 for 34 meters. We need them to go a little bit higher up. So I, I'd say the, the sweet spot is between $5,000 and $10,000. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you.